Karnaki shook a friendly fist at me as I entered late. Then he opened the door into the dining room and ushered the four of us, Jessop, Arkwright, Taylor and myself, into dinner. We dined well as usual, and equally as usual. Karnaki was pretty silent during the meal. At the end, we took our wine and cigars to our usual positions, and Karnaki, having got himself comfortable in his big chair, began without any preliminary. I've just got back from Ireland again, he said, and I thought you chaps would be interested to hear my news. Besides, I fancy I shall see the thing clearer after I have told it all out straight. I must tell you this, though, at the beginning. Up to the present moment, I have been utterly and completely stumped. I have tumbled upon one of the most peculiar cases of haunting, or devilment of some sort, that I have come up against. Now listen. I have been spending the last few weeks at Ayerstray Castle, about 20 miles northeast of Galway. I got a letter about a month ago from a Mr. Sid K. Tassock, who it seemed had bought the place lately and moved in, only to find that he'd bought a very peculiar piece of property. When I got there, he met me at the station, driving a jaunting car, and drove me up to the castle, which, by the way, he called a house shanty. I found that he was pigging it there with his boy brother and another American, who seemed to be half servant and half companion. It seems that all the servants had left the place in a body, as you might say, and now they were managing among themselves, assisted by some day help. The three of them got together a scratch feed, and Tassock told me all about the trouble whilst we were at table. It is most extraordinary and different from anything that I've had to do with, though that buzzing case was very queer too. Tassock began right in the middle of his story. We've got a room in this shanty, he said, which has got a most infernal whistling in it sort of haunting it. The thing starts any time you never know when, and it goes on until it frightens you. All the servants have gone, as you know. It's not ordinary whistling, and it isn't the wind. Wait till you hear it. We're all carrying guns, said the boy, and slapped his coat pocket. As bad as that, I said, and the older boy nodded. It may be soft, he replied, but wait till you've heard it. Sometimes I think it's some infernal thing, and the next moment... I'm just as sure that someone's playing a trick on me. Why? I asked. What's to be gained? You mean, he said, that people usually have some good reason for playing tricks as elaborate as this. Well, I'll tell you. There's a lady in this province by the name of Miss Donahue, who's going to be my wife this day two months. She's more beautiful than they make them, and so far as I can see, I've just stuck my head into an Irish hornet's nest. There's about a score of hot young Irishmen been courting her these two years gone. And now that I'm come along and cut them out, they feel raw against me. Do you begin to understand the possibilities? Yes, I said. Perhaps I do in a vague sort of way, but I don't see how all this affects the room. Like this, he said. When I'd fixed it up with Miss Donahue, I looked out for a place and brought this little house shanty. Afterward, I told her, one evening during dinner, that I'd decided to tie up here, and then she asked me whether I wasn't afraid of the whistling room. I told her it must have been thrown in gratis, as I'd heard nothing about it. There were some of her men friends present, and I saw a smile go round. I found out, after a bit of questioning, that several people have brought this place during the last twenty-odd years, and it was always on the market again after a trial. Well, the chaps started to bait me a bit and offered to take bets after dinner that I'd not stay six months in the place. I looked once or twice to Miss Donahue so as to be sure I was getting the note of the talky-talky, but I could see that she didn't take it as a joke at all. Partly, I think, because there was a bit of a sneer in the way the men were tackling me, and partly because she really believes there is something in this yarn of the whistling room. However, after dinner... I did what I could to even things up with the others. I nailed all their bets and screwed them down hard and safe. I guess some of them are going to be hard hit, unless I lose, which I don't mean to. Well, there you have practically the whole yarn. Not quite, I told him. All that I know is that you've bought a castle with a room in it that is in some way queer, and that you've been doing some betting. Also I know that your servants have got frightened and run away. 
Tell me something about the whistling. Oh, that, said Tassock. That started the second night we were in. I'd had a good look round the room in the daytime, as you can understand, for the talk up at Arlestray, Miss Donoghue's place, had made me wonder a bit. But it seems just as usual as some of the other rooms in the old wing, only perhaps a bit more lonesome. But that may be only because of the talk about it, you know. The whistling started about ten o'clock, on the second night, as I said. Tom and I were in the library when we heard an awfully queer whistling, coming along the east corridor. The room is in the east wing, you know. That's that blessed ghost, I said to Tom, and we collared the lamps off the table and went up to have a look. I tell you, even as we dug along the corridor, it took me a bit in the throat. It was so beastly queer. It was a sort of tune, in a way, but more as if a devil or some rotten thing were laughing at you and going to get round at your back. That's how it makes you feel. When we got to the door, we didn't wait, but rushed it open, and then I tell you the sound of the thing fairly hit me in the face. Tom said he got it the same way, sort of felt stunned and bewildered. We looked all round and soon got so nervous we just cleared out and I locked the door. We came down here and had a stiff peg each. Then we got fit again and began to think we'd been nicely had. So we took sticks and went out into the grounds thinking after all it must be some of those confounded Irishmen working the ghost trick on us. But there was not a leg stirring. We went back into the house and walked over it and then paid another visit to the room but we simply couldn't stand it. We fairly ran out and locked the door again. I don't know how to put it into words, but I had a feeling of being up against something that was rottenly dangerous, you know? We've carried our guns ever since. Of course, we had a real turn out of the room next day, and the whole house place, and we even hunted round the grounds, but there was nothing queer. And now I don't know what to think, except that the sensible part of me tells me that it's some plan of these wild Irishmen to try to take a rise out of me. Done anything since? I asked him. Yes, he said. Watched outside of the door of the room at nights, and chased round the grounds and sounded the walls and floor of the room. We've done everything we could think of, and it's beginning to get on our nerves, so we sent for you. By this we'd finished eating. As we rose from the table, Tassock suddenly called out, Shh! Hark! We were instantly silent, listening. Then I heard it, an extraordinary hooning whistle, monstrous and inhuman, coming from far away through corridors to my right. By God, said Tassock, and it's scarcely dark yet. Collar those candles, both of you, and come along. In a few moments, we were all out of the door and racing up the stairs. Tassock turned into a long corridor and we followed, shielding our candles as we ran. The sounds seemed to fill all the passage as we drew near, until I had the feeling that the whole air throbbed under the power of some wanton, immense force, a sense of an actual taint, as you might say, of monstrosity all about us. Tassock unlocked the door, then, giving it a push with his foot, jumped back and drew his revolver. As the door flew open, the sound beat out at us, with an effect impossible to explain to one who's not heard it with a certain horrible personal note in it, as if in there, in the darkness, you could picture the room rocking and creaking in a mad, vile glee to its own filthy piping and whistling and hooning. To stand there and listen was to be stunned by realisation. It was as if someone showed you the mouth of a vast pit suddenly and said, that's hell, and you knew that they had spoken the truth. Do you get it? Even a little bit? I stepped back a pace into the room and held the candle over my head and looked quickly round. Tassock and his brother joined me and the man came up at the back and we all held our candles high. I was deafened with the shrill piping hoon of the whistling and then, clear in my ear, something seemed to be saying to me, get out of here, quick, quick, quick. As you chaps know, I never neglect that sort of thing. Sometimes it may be nothing but nerves, but as you will remember, it was just such a warning that saved me in the grey dog case, and in the yellow finger experiments as well as other times. 
Well, I turned sharp round to the others. Out, he said. For God's sake, out, quick. And in an instant, I had them into the passage. There came an extraordinary yelling scream into the hideous whistling, and then, like a clap of thunder, an utter silence. I slammed the door and locked it. Then, taking the key, I looked round at the others. They were pretty white, and I imagine I must have looked that way too. And there we stood a moment, silent. "'Come down out of this and have some whisky," said Tassock at last, in a voice he tried to make ordinary, and he led the way. I was the back man, and I know we all kept looking over our shoulders. When we got downstairs, Tassock passed the bottle round. He took a drink himself and slapped his glass down onto the table, then sat down with a thud. "'That's a lovely thing to have in the house with you, isn't it?' he said. And directly afterward, "'What on earth made you hustle us all out like that, Karnaki? "'Something seemed to be telling me to get out quick,' I said. "'Sounds a bit silly, superstitious, I know, "'but when you're meddling with this sort of thing, "'you've got to take notice of queer fancies "'and risk being laughed at.' "'I told him then about the grey dog business, "'and he nodded a lot to that. "'Of course,' I said, "'this may be nothing more than those would-be rivals of yours "'playing some funny game.' But personally, though I'm going to keep an open mind, I feel that there is something beastly and dangerous about this thing. We talked for a while longer, and then Tassock suggested billiards, which we played in a pretty half-hearted fashion, and all the time cocking an ear to the door, as you might say, for sounds. But none came, and later, after coffee, he suggested early bed and a thorough overhaul of the room on the morrow. My bedroom was in the newer part of the castle, and the door opened into the picture gallery. At the east end of the gallery was the entrance to the corridor of the east wing. This was shut off from the gallery by two old and heavy oak doors, which looked rather odd and quaint beside the more modern doors of the various rooms. When I reached my room, I did not go to bed, but began to unpack my instrument trunk, of which I had retained the key. I intended to take one or two preliminary steps at once in my investigation of the extraordinary whistling. Presently, when the castle had settled into quietness, I slipped out of my room and across to the entrance of the great corridor. I opened one of the low squat doors and threw the beam of my pocket searchlight down the passage. It was empty and I went through the doorway and pushed to the oak behind me. Then along the great passageway, throwing my light before and behind, and keeping my revolver handy. I had hung a protective belt of garlic round my neck, and the smell of it seemed to fill the corridor and give me assurance. For as you all know, it is a wonderful protection against the more usual, eerie forms of semi-materialisation by which I suppose the whistling might be produced. Though, at that period of my investigation, I was quite prepared to find it due to some perfectly natural cause for it's astonishing the enormous number of cases that prove to have nothing abnormal in them. In addition to wearing the necklet, I had plugged my ears loosely with garlic, and as I did not intend to stay more than a few minutes in the room, I hoped to be safe. When I reached the door and put my hand into my pocket for the key, I had a sudden feeling of sickening funk, but I was not going to back out if I could help it. I unlocked the door and turned the handle. Then I gave the door a sharp push with my foot, as Tassock had done, and drew my revolver, though I did not expect to have any use for it, really. I shone the searchlight all round the room and then stepped inside, with a disgustingly horrible feeling of walking slap into a waiting danger. I stood a few seconds waiting and nothing happened, and the empty room showed bare from corner to corner. And then, you know, I realised that the room was full of an abominable silence. Can you understand that? A sort of purposeful silence just as sickening as any of the filthy noises the things have power to make. Do you remember what I told you about that silent garden business? Well, this room had just that same malevolent silence. The beastly quietness of a thing that is looking at you and not seeable itself, and thinks that it's got you. Oh, I recognised it instantly, and I whipped the top off my lantern so as to have light over the whole room. Then I set to, working like fury and keeping my glance all about me. 
I sealed the two windows with lengths of human hair right across, and sealed them at every frame. As I worked, a queer, scarcely perceptible tenseness stole into the air of the place, and the silence seemed, if you can understand me, to grow more solid. I knew then that I had no business there without full protection, for I was practically certain that this was no mere eerie development, but one of the worst forms, as the sati, that grunting man case, you know. I finished the window and hurried over to the great fireplace. This is a huge affair and has a queer gallows iron, I think they're called, projecting from the back of the arch. I sealed the opening with seven human hairs, the seventh crossing the six others. Then just as I was making an end, a low mocking whistle grew in the room. A cold, nervous prickling went up my spine and round my forehead from the back. The hideous sound filled all the room with an extraordinary, grotesque parody of human whistling, too gigantic to be human, as if something gargantuan and monstrous made the sound softly. As I stood there a last moment, pressing down the final seal, I had no doubt but that I had come across one of those rare and horrible cases of the inanimate reproducing the functions of the animal. I made a grab for my lamp and went quickly to the door, looking over my shoulder and listening for the thing that I expected. It came just as I got my hand upon the handle, a squeal of incredible malevolent anger piercing through the low hooning of the whistling. I dashed out, slamming the door and locking it. I leant a little against the opposite wall of the corridor feeling rather funny, for it had been a narrow squeak. There'd be no safety to be gained by guards of holiness when the monster hath power to speak through wood and stone. So runs the passage in the Sing Sand manuscript, and I proved it in that nodding door business. There is no protection against this particular form of monster, except, possibly, for a fractional period of time for it can reproduce itself in or take to its purpose the very protective material which you may use and has the power to form within the pentacle, though not immediately. There is of course the possibility of the unknown last line of the Sama ritual being uttered, but it is too uncertain to count upon and the danger is too hideous and even then it has no power to protect for more than maybe five beats of the heart, as the Sig Sand has it. Inside of the room, there was now a constant, meditative, hooning whistling. But presently this ceased and the silence seemed worse, for there is such a sense of hidden mischief in a silence. After a little, I sealed the door with crossed hairs and then cleared off down the great passage and so to bed. For a long time I lay awake, but managed eventually to get some sleep. Yet about two o'clock I was waked by the hooning whistling of the room coming to me, even through the closed doors. The sound was tremendous, and seemed to beat through the whole house with a presiding sense of terror. As if, I remember thinking, some monstrous giant had been holding mad carnival with itself at the end of that great passage. I got up and sat on the edge of the bed, wondering whether to go along and have a look at the seal, and suddenly there came a thump on my door, and Tassip walked in with his dressing gown over his pyjamas. I thought it would have waked you, so I came along to have a talk, he said. I can't sleep. Beautiful, isn't it? Extraordinary, I said, and tossed in my case. He lit a cigarette, and we sat and talked for about an hour, and all the time that noise went on down at the end of the big corridor. Suddenly, Tassock stood up. Let's take our guns and go and examine the brute, he said, and turned toward the door. No, I said, by Jove, no. I can't say anything definite yet. Well, I believe that room is about as dangerous as it well can be. Haunted? Really haunted? he asked, keenly, and without any of his frequent banter. I told him, of course, that I could not say a definite yes or no to such a question, but that I hoped to be able to make a statement soon. Then I gave him a little lecture on the false rematerialization of the animate force through the inanimate inert. He began then to see the particular way in which the room might be dangerous, if it were really the subject of a manifestation. About an hour later the whistling ceased quite suddenly, and Tassock went off again to bed. I went back to mine also, and eventually got another spell of sleep. 
In the morning, I went along to the room. I found the seals of the door intact. Then I went in. The window seals and the hair were all right, but the seventh hair across the great fireplace was broken. This set me thinking. I knew that it might very possibly have snapped through my having tensioned it too highly. But then again, it might have been broken by something else. Yet, it was scarcely possible that a man, for instance, could have passed between the six unbroken hairs, for no one would ever have noticed them entering the room that way, you see, but just walk through them ignorant of their very existence. I removed the other hairs and the seals, then I looked up the chimney. It went straight up and I could see blue sky at the top. It was a big open flue and free from any suggestion of hiding places or corners. Yet of course I did not trust to any such casual examination, and after breakfast I put on my overalls and climbed to the very top, sounding all the way, but I found nothing. Then I came down and went over the whole of the room, floor, ceiling and walls, mapping them out in six inch squares and sounding with both hammer and probe, but there was nothing abnormal. Afterward I made a three week search of the whole castle in the same thorough way, but found nothing. I went even further then, for at night, when the whistling commenced, I made a microphone test. You see, if the whistling were mechanically produced, this test would have made evident to me the working of the machinery, if there were any such concealed within the walls. It certainly was an up-to-date method of examination, as you must allow. Of course, I did not think that any of Tassock's rivals had fixed up any mechanical contrivance, but I thought it just possible that there had been some such thing for producing the whistling made away back in the years, perhaps with the intention of giving the room a reputation that would ensure its being free of inquisitive folk. You see what I mean? Well, of course, it was just possible, if this were the case, that someone knew the secret of the machinery and was utilising the knowledge to play this devil of a prank on Tassock. The microphone test of the walls would certainly have made this known to me, as I've said, but there was nothing of the sort in the castle, so that I had practically no doubt at all now but that it was a genuine case of what is popularly termed haunting. All this time, every night, and sometimes most of each night, the hooning whistling of the room was intolerable. It was as if an intelligence there knew that steps were being taken against it, and piped and hooned in a sort of mad mocking contempt. I tell you, it was as extraordinary as it was horrible. Time after time, I went along, tiptoeing noiselessly on stockinged feet to the sealed door, for I always kept the room sealed. I went at all hours of the night, and often the whistling inside would seem to change to a brutally malignant note, as though the half-animate monster saw me plainly through the shut door. And all the time the shrieking, hooning whistling would fill the whole corridor, so that I used to feel a precious lonely chap messing about there with one of Hell's mysteries. And every morning I would enter the room and examine the different hairs and seals. You see, after the first week I'd stretch parallel hairs all along the walls of the room, and along the ceiling. But over the floor, which was of polished stone, I had set out little colourless wafers, tacky side upmost. Each wafer was numbered, and they were arranged over a definite plan, so that I should be able to trace the exact movements of any living thing that went across the floor. You will see that no material being or creature could possibly have entered that room without leaving many signs to tell me about it. But nothing was ever disturbed, and I began to think that I should have to risk an attempt to stay the night in the room, in the electric pentacle. Yet, mind you, I knew that it would be a crazy thing to do, but I was getting stumped, and ready to do anything. Once, about midnight, I did break the seal on the door, and have a quick look in. But, I tell you, the whole room gave one mad yell, and seemed to come toward me in a great belly of shadows as if the walls had bellied in toward me. Of course that must have been fancy. Anyway, the yell was sufficient, and I slammed the door and locked it, feeling a bit weak down my spine. You know the feeling. And then, when I got to that state of readiness for anything, I made something of a discovery. 
It was about one in the morning, and I was walking slowly round the castle, keeping in the soft grass. I'd come under the shadow of the east front, and far above me, I could hear the vile hooning whistle of the room, up in the darkness of the unlit wing. Then suddenly, a little in front of me, I heard a man's voice, speaking low, but evidently in glee. By By George, George, you chaps, but I wouldn't care to bring a wife home in that, it said in the tone of the cultured Irish. Someone started to reply, but there came a sharp exclamation, and then a rush, and I heard footsteps running in all directions. Evidently, the men had spotted me. For a few seconds I stood there, feeling an awful ass. After all, they were at the bottom of the haunting. Do you see what a big fool it made me seem? I had no doubt but that they were some of Tassock's rivals, and here I'd been feeling in every bone that I had hit a real bad genuine case. And then, you know, there came the memory of hundreds of details that made me just as much in doubt again. Anyway, whether it was natural or abnatural, there was a great deal yet to be cleared up. I told Tassock next morning what I'd discovered, and through the whole of every night for five nights we kept a close watch round the east wing, but there was never a sign of anyone prowling about, and all the time, almost from evening to dawn, that grotesque whistling would hoon incredibly, far above us in the darkness. On the morning after the fifth night, I received a wire from here, which brought me home by the next boat. I explained to Tassock that I was simply bound to come away for a few days, but told him to keep up the watch round the castle. One thing I was very careful to do, and that was to make him absolutely promise never to go into the room between sunset and sunrise. I made it clear to him that we knew nothing definite, one way or the other, and if the room were what I first thought it to be, it might be a lot better for him to die first than enter it after dark. When I got here and had finished my business, I thought you chaps would be interested, and also I wanted to get it all spread out clear in my mind, so I rung you up. I'm going over again tomorrow, and when I get back I ought to have something pretty extraordinary to tell you. By the way, there is a curious thing I forgot to tell you. I tried to get a phonographic record of the whistling, but it simply produced no impression on the wax at all. That is one of the things that's made me feel queer, I can tell you. Another extraordinary thing is that the microphone will not magnify the sound, will not even transmit it, seems to take no account of it and acts as if it were non-existent. I'm absolutely and utterly stumped up to the present. I'm a wee bit curious to see whether any of your dear clever heads can make daylight of it. I cannot, not yet. He rose to his feet. Good night all, he said and began to usher us out abruptly, but without offence, into the night. A fortnight later, he dropped each of us a card, and you can imagine that I was not late this time. When we arrived, Karnaki took us straight into dinner, and when we had finished, and all made ourselves comfortable, he began again where he'd left off. Now just listen quietly, for I have got something pretty queer to tell you. I got back late at night, and I had to walk up to the castle, as I'd not warned them that I was coming. It was bright moonlight, so that the walk was rather a pleasure than otherwise. When I got there, the whole place was in darkness, and I thought I would take a walk round outside, to see whether Tassock or his brother was keeping watch. But I could not find them anywhere, and concluded that they had got tired of it, and gone off to bed. As I returned across the front of the east wing, I caught the hooning whistling of the room, coming down strangely through the stillness of the night. It had a queer note in it, I remember, low and constant, queerly meditative. I looked up at the window bright in the moonlight and got a sudden thought to bring a ladder from the stable yard and try to get a look into the room through the window. With this notion, I hunted round at the back of the castle, among the straggle of offices, and presently found a long, fairly light ladder though it was heavy enough for one, goodness knows. I thought at first that I should never get it reared. I managed at last, and let the ends rest very quietly against the wall, a little below the sill of the larger window. Then, going silently, I went up the ladder. Presently I heard my face above the sill and was looking in alone with the moonlight. 
Of course, the queer whistling sounded louder up there, but it still conveyed that peculiar sense of something whistling quietly to itself. Can you understand? Though for all the meditative lowness of the note, the horrible gargantuan quality was distinct. A mighty parody of the human, as if I stood there and listened to the whistling from the lips of a monster with a man's soul. And then, you know, I saw something. The floor in the middle of the huge empty room was puckered upward in the centre, into a strange soft-looking mound, parted at the top into an ever-changing hole that pulsated to that great gentle hooning. At times as I watched, I saw the heaving of the indented mound gap across with a queer inward suction, as with the drawing of an enormous breath. Then the thing would dilate and pout once more to the incredible melody. And suddenly as I stared dumb, it came to me that the thing was living. I was looking at two enormous blackened lips, blistered and brutal, there in the pale moonlight. Abruptly, they bulged out to a vast pouting mound of force and sound, stiffened and swollen, and hugely massive and clean cut in the moonbeams. And a great sweat lay heavy on the vast upper lip. In the same moment of time, the whistling had burst into a mad, screaming note that seemed to stun me even where I stood outside of the window. And then the following moment, I was staring blankly at the solid, undisturbed floor of the room, smooth, polished stone flooring from wall to wall, and there was an absolute silence. You can picture me staring into the quiet room and knowing what I knew. I felt like a sick, frightened kid and wanted to slide, quietly, down the ladder and run away. But in that very instant, I heard Tassock's voice calling to me from within the room for help. Help? My God! But I got such an awful dazed feeling, and I had a vague, bewildered notion that after all, it was the Irishman who had got him in there and were taking it out of him. And then the call came again, and I burst the window and jumped in to help him. I had a confused idea that the call had come from within the shadow of the great fireplace, and I raced across to it, but there was no one there. Tassock! I shouted, and my voice went empty sounding round the great apartment, and then in a flash I knew that Tassock had never called. I whirled round sick with fear toward the window, and as I did so, a frightful exultant whistling scream burst through the room. On my left, the end wall had bellied in toward me, in a pair of gargantuan lips, black and utterly monstrous, to within a yard of my face. I fumbled for a mad instant at my revolver, not for it, but myself. The danger was a thousand times worse than death. And then suddenly, the unknown last line of the Sama ritual was whispered, quite audibly in the room. Instantly, the thing happened that I had known once before. There came a sense as of dust falling continually and monotonously, and I knew that my life hung uncertain and suspended for a flash, in a brief, reeling vertigo of unseeable things. Then that ended, and I knew that I might live. My soul and body blended again, and life and power came to me. I dashed furiously at the window and hurled myself out, head foremost, for I can tell you that I had stopped being afraid of death. I crashed down onto the ladder and slithered, grabbing and grabbing, and so came some way or other alive to the bottom. And there I sat in the soft, wet grass with the moonlight all about me, and far above, through the broken window of the room, there was a low whistling. This is the chief of it. I was not hurt, and I went round to the front and knocked Tassock up. When they let me in, we had a long yarn over some good whiskey, for I was shaken to pieces and I explained things as much as I could. I told Tassock that the room would have to come down, and every fragment of it burned in a blast furnace, erected within a pentacle. He nodded, there was nothing to say. Then I went to bed. We turned a small army onto the work, and within ten days that lovely thing had gone up in smoke, and what was left was calcined and clean. It was when the workmen were stripping the panelling, that I got hold of a sound notion of the beginnings of that beastly development. Over the great fireplace, 
after the great oak panels had been torn down. I found that there was let into the masonry a scroll work of stone, with on it an old inscription, in ancient Celtic, that here in this room was burned Diane Tiense, jester of King Alsof, who made the song of foolishness upon King Arnor of the Seventh Castle. When I got the translation clear, I gave it to Tassuk. He was tremendously excited, for he knew the old tale, and took me down to the library to look at an old parchment that gave the story in detail. Afterward, I found that the incident was well known about the countryside, but always regarded more as a legend than as history, and no one seemed ever to have dreamt that the old east wing of Airstrait Castle was the remains of the ancient Seventh Castle. From the old parchment, I gathered that there had been a pretty dirty job done away back in the years. It seemed that King Alsof and King Arnor had been enemies by birthright, as you might say truly, but that nothing more than a little raiding had occurred on either side for years, until Diane Tinse made the song of foolishness upon King Arnor and sang it before King Alsof, and so greatly was it appreciated that King Alsof gave the jester one of his ladies to wife. Presently, all the people of the land had come to know the song, and so it came at last to King Arnor, who was so angered that he made war upon his old enemy, and took and burned him and his castle. But Diantiense, the jester, he brought with him to his own place, and having torn his tongue out because of the song which he had made and sung, he imprisoned him in the room in the east wing which was evidently used for unpleasant purposes, and the jester's wife he kept for himself, having a fancy for her prettiness. But one night, Diane Tiense's wife was not to be found, and in the morning they discovered her lying dead in her husband's arms, and he sitting, whistling the song of foolishness, for he had no longer the power to sing it. Then they roasted Diane Tiense in the great fireplace, probably from that self-same galley iron, which I have already mentioned. And until he died, Diane Tiense ceased not to whistle the song of foolishness, which he could no longer sing. But afterwards, in that room, there was often heard at night the sound of something whistling, and there grew a power in that room, so that none dared to sleep in it. And presently, it would seem, the king went to another castle, for the whistling troubled him. There you have it all. Of course, that is only a rough rendering of the translation of the parchment, but it sounds extraordinarily quaint. Don't you think so? Yes, I said, answering for the lot. But how did the thing grow to such a tremendous manifestation? One of those cases of continuity of thought producing a positive action upon the immediate surrounding material replied Karnaki. The development must have been going forward through centuries to have produced such a monstrosity. It was a true instance of Sati manifestation, which I can best explain by likening it to a living spiritual fungus, which involves the very structure of the ether fibre itself, and of course, in so doing, acquires an essential control over the material substance involved in it. It is impossible to make it plainer in a few words. What broke the seventh hair? asked Taylor. But Karnaki did not know. He thought it was probably nothing but being too severely tensioned. He also explained that they found out that the men who'd run away had not been up to mischief, but had come over secretly, merely to hear the whistling, which, indeed, had suddenly become the talk of the whole countryside. One other thing, said Arkwright, have you any idea what governs the use of the unknown last line of the Sama ritual? I know of course that it was used by the abhuman priests in the incantation of Ray, but what used it on your behalf, and what made it? You had better read Harzan's monograph, and my addenda to it, on astral and astral coordination and interference, said Konaki. It is an extraordinary subject and I can only say here that the human vibration may not be insulated from the astral, as is always believed to be the case 
in interferences by the abhuman, without immediate action being taken by those forces which govern the spinning of the outer circle. In other words, it is being proved, time after time, that there is some inscrutable protective force constantly intervening between the human soul, not the body, mind you, and the outer monstrosities. Am I clear? Yes, I think so, I replied. And you believe that the room had become the material expression of the ancient jester? That his soul, rotten with hatred, had bred into a monster, eh? I asked. Yes, said Karnaki, nodding. I think you've put my thought rather neatly. It is a queer coincidence that Miss Donahue is supposed to be descended, so I've heard since, from the same King Arnor. It makes one think some curious thoughts, doesn't it? The marriage coming on, and the room waking to fresh life. If she'd gone into that room ever, eh? It had waited a long time. Sins of the fathers. Yes, I've thought of that. They're to be married next week, and I'm to be best man, which is the thing I hate. In who won his bets, rather. Just think, if ever she'd gone into that room. Pretty horrible, eh? He nodded his head grimly, and we four nodded back. Then he rose and took us collectively to the door, and presently thrust us forth, in friendly fashion, onto the embankment and into the fresh night air. Good night, we all called back, and went to our various homes. If she had, eh? If she had. That is what I kept thinking. Thanks very much for listening. If you'd like to contact us or check out what we've been up to, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. If you enjoyed the video today, please do like it, subscribe to the channel and ding the bell to receive notifications about new videos. See you in the next one.